Early in The Lord of the Rings, we learn about Isildur, son of a great king, a great king himself, who takes up his father's sword and cuts off Sauron's finger, depriving him of the One Ring, and kickstarting the central struggle of the plot. He is incapable of destroying the ring, and it slowly corrupts his mind until he is betrayed by it and killed, a shadow of his former self. But Rings of Power offered a unique opportunity, an opportunity to see in Isildur before the ring's corruption, back when he was just a young man, brave enough to face Sauron when all hope was lost. We could at last see the nobility that the ring corrupted. So what did the show do with that opportunity? Well, let's see what actually happened in his plot. Back in season one, he is in training to be in the Sea Guard due to pressures from his father. He doesn't want to join the Sea Guard because he wants to find the real Numenor, whatever that means. He intentionally gets himself kicked off and accidentally also gets his friends kicked off, much to their understandable wrath. His father's furious and he becomes listless. Then his kingdom announces that they're getting a force together to go to war and he gets it in his head that this was the purpose he was looking for. He begs the friends whose lives he screwed up to help him which they refuse, so he sneaks on a ship, saves a politician's son, and suddenly he's on the cavalry, though he is a little annoyed that they're making him muck horse stables. On the boat, he has a conversation with Galadriel, where he reiterates that he doesn't believe he lives in the real Numenor, and the story, yet again, fails to clarify what that means. Galadriel implies that it used to exist, but now only exists in Isildur's heart but we have no frame of reference for what that old Numenor looks like. This is reminiscent of The Dream of Rome from Gladiator, but in that movie, you know that means getting rid of emperors and returning Rome to the Senate and its people. What is the dream of Numenor that lingers in Isildur's heart? How was Numenor different in the past? We know it was more religious, but that's clearly not what Isildur means. His father is the religious one, and he doesn't approve of Isildur's obsession with old Numenor. So what is real Numenor? It drives so many of Isildur's early decisions, and we don't even know what it is. It beggars belief that this is never explained. This scene right here could have been a moment for Galadriel or Isildur to discuss what made the Numenor of old so great, so that the audience can understand what was worth disappointing his father for. What was worth leaving the sea guard for? What was worth leaving it all behind for? But no. They speak in vague terms, and then Elendil comes. Galadriel asks about Isildur's mother, and Elendil says he has a bad feeling about this mission, and then, tacked on as he's leaving, he says Isildur's mother drowned. What a strange way to order that dialogue, but whatever. Put a pin in that information for a few years. Season 2 would like to revisit this. Anyway, Isildur gets his first taste of battle, which goes really well. One of his friends has already had enough of violence and wants to settle down and be a farmer or something, but Isildur himself is pretty cheerful. But that cheer is false. Beric, his horse, is agitated, and after Elendil calms Beric down with Aragorn powers, he explains that Isildur is connected to his horse on a spiritual level. Beric is reacting to a secret conflict in Isildur's heart, one that we don't know about. At that point in the story, what do we know about Isildur? Well, he appears to be an idealist dreaming of some far-off place that feels purposeless. He's reckless and doesn't think through his actions, is a bit entitled, but his heart appears to be in the right place, even if it is weighed down by something. This is the starting point the show decided to go with. Well, at this point, the season is almost over, but let's be generous and call it a starting point. There are several ways you can take an idealistic character like this, but they all start with hitting him with a nice helping of reality that forces him to grow as a character. So do they do that? Well, suddenly a volcano blows up, destroying much of the army. He watches his friend die, and then a burning house falls on him. And we never see him for the rest of the season. That's his contribution to season one. No, I'm serious. That's all that happens. They tried to pretend this guy, this guy, died in a burning building, instead of, you know, doing something narratively relevant for his arc. Which begs the question, what was his arc in that season? He yearns to go off and find the real Numenor. When he finally does go off somewhere new, he is confronted with the horrors of war. All right, I see the vision. So how does that change him? Well, I don't know. A house fell on him before we could see his reaction. But season one ended on a cliffhanger, I hear you say. 
It isn't fair to judge now when the character arc isn't done yet. So fine. What happened in season two? <laughs> I'll tell you what happens in season two. He survived the burning house. Sorry if that was a big plot twist to you. And somehow got out of that off screen. He also never really talks about the horrors he saw in that burning hell for the whole season. This is probably a consequence of waiting so long to get back to his story. Every other character got an episode to react to the immediate fallout of Mount Doom erupting, but the show was still pretending Isildur was dead at that point. So the writers forgot that he still needed to process it himself. Isildur's horse finds him in a spider cave. Not just any spider cave, but Shelob's spider cave, which is... Why does it have to be Shelob again? It doesn't make sense and feels forced. But hey, it's a name people know and that's good enough, right? Right? Anyway, he escapes that and then gets stabbed by a girl who he immediately forgives and likes. They travel together and encounter a man on the side of the road. The girl warns Isildur, but he doesn't listen and it turns into an ambush. He is saved by a rondeer, but not before they steal his horse. Then he witnesses a funeral for a woman they don't know, and is then patched up by that dead woman's son. The scene is mostly a rondeer explaining Bronwyn's death to the audience and how he blames himself for her death, but he also assures Isildur that his father did not abandon him and that the Numenor forces have promised to return. Your family will be whole, he promises which cuts Theo deep, seeing as his mother just died and his family will never be whole. I like this moment. It sets Isildur and Theo as foils a bit, which the show does expand. Isildur's next scene is with Theo, where he talks about aqueducts and the splendor of Numenor. Now here we have a chance for character growth. Remember, Isildur has been depicted as someone trying desperately to get away from his home, and this moment was an opportunity for him to realize the wonders that he had taken for granted and appreciate his home more. I think this conversation is an attempt to show this. Maybe? If it's so grand, why'd you leave? I heard there were grander things in Middle-earth. All the wonder for the glory of Numenor is on Theo's end. There's no real moment where he pauses and realizes he misses home but maybe that's coming. The scene leans in that direction? Oh well, we'll see. Theo offers to help Isildur get his horse back. In the next scene, he pours out his heart to the girl he just met yesterday. She talks about her survivor's guilt, and he admits something he has told no one. We hear about the drowning of his mother, and how it happened while saving him. Finally, something I can sink my teeth in. It recontextualizes his thirst for adventure at the beginning of the show. He can't just join the Sea Guard and do what everyone else does. He has to make a difference. He has to be more. He has to be worthy of his mother's sacrifice. Plenty of us feel the need to live up to the sacrifices our parents made for us. That is something real. His motivation is extreme, but human. It's something tangible that could resonate with the audience. He could also recontextualize his later great and terrible deeds as the acts of someone who needs his life to matter. Bizarrely, the show does everything in its power to blunt the effect this has on a sealed door. The scene instead focuses on how the story makes others feel, how it relates to Theo and how it relates to Astrid. Theo's reaction to it makes sense and I think works narratively, but his conversation with Astrid is just bizarre. A sealed door tells her he got his mother killed and she kind of doesn't react. She drowned, saving my life. After my mom. She immediately moved on to talking about her own mother, barely acknowledging the admission at all. And then when he explains his driving motivation to be great, she immediately tells him his mother's sacrifice was a gift and he shouldn't feel obligated to do something grand. Which is way too early to be feeding him this message. We just learned about this trauma and the character flaws attached to it and the story is trying to fix it in the same scene it's introduced. It's like nipping a narrative bud before it blooms. Like, what are you doing? You let that stuff brew! <sighs> Theo and Isildur go to the horse thieves camp to stealthily reclaim Beric. We get this brief moment where Isildur holds still to avoid being spotted. And I don't know what it is about it, but it is the only time in the entire show that he gives off proper Dunedain ranger energy. Anyway, Theo distracts the men to help Isildur, becoming a nominee for the dumbest gambit 
ever award. He shows the scar on his arm and tries to pass it off as Adara's brand, but then just says some cryptic stuff about it that these random men would have no frame of reference for. Seriously, I know he's a dumb teenager, but what was his plan? We never find out. His brilliant strategy is interrupted by fighting, and in the chaos, Theo is abducted by... something. You assume it's the troll, but it actually might be the Ents that are about to show up, but you can't be sure because the story will never actually clarify why or how he was captured. Those pesky questions aren't important. Arondir reveals that Astrid is one of the wild men who swore allegiance to Adar. Isildur feels betrayed, and they bicker about it as they, and Arondir, stroll through the woods looking for Theo. They get attacked by a mudworm thing, and Astrid could have run away, but chose to try to help them. Isildur and Arondir had no way of seeing this act, but they know about it anyway. Arondir leaves the choice up to Isildur, who decides to trust her and free her. She immediately rewards him by threatening him with his sword, which yet again he is completely chill about and forgives instantly. Before he can calm her down, however, suddenly some Ents show up, angered by the presence of the sword, and Arondir has his best scene in the show by a country mile. But as far as Isildur is concerned, his contributions to this mission are over. Neither he nor Astrid ended up being needed for this rescue. Arondir gets the Ents to free Theo and the rest of the prisoners, which includes Astrid's fiancé. Poor him. His girl met the protagonist. He's got no chance. Then there's a scene where Isildur thanks Theo for patching him up, and Theo asks Isildur how he handles being responsible for his mother's death. Isildur's response is a fascinating lesson in trying to retroactively create a character arc without doing any of the work. He admits he handled his responsibility in his mother's death poorly, but that being out in the world made him realize how small he is and that he's going to do better. What? What has happened between him explaining what happened to his mother and now to make him come to this conclusion? He fought some bandits and a mudworm thing. He saw some Ents and he met a girl. And besides maybe the girl, nothing about any of those experiences have been emotionally challenging. Where is this arc coming from? When I piece each disparate scene together, I think I see what the show is trying for. Because of his survivor's guilt, Isildur feels like he needs to do something great. He is disenchanted with his home and wants to find the real Numenor. His journey through Middle-earth makes him realize how small he is, and so he intends to take Astrid's advice and let his guilt and obsession with greatness go. Okay. Okay. We are never with Isildur on his emotional journey. We get the pieces for it only after it is over. That's not how character arcs work. You can't just give him a couple random D&D encounters and call it a grand adventure. You can't just have a character say he's changed without showing the steps for his transformation. Speaking of sudden changes, Astrid comes in and she loves Isildur now, even though they've known each other for... well. It actually could be months, but the show really, really struggles to portray the progression of time. It feels like it's been days, but it might be longer. Astrid and Isildur share a kiss. He tries to take her with him to Numenor, but Kemen, Pharazon's son, who is suddenly here now, won't let him. So he sails home alone and sad. Because of this business with Astrid, it is unclear if he now has a new appreciation for home or if he still is as disenchanted as before. Is he just going back home to see his family? You don't know. I think the show wants you to feel sad that he's going back home because he's leaving behind the girl, but all the different variables muddies the moment for the audience. Isildur's story just leaves you on a strange note. And that's it. That's the end of season two. No, seriously, that's all that happened. And through it all, one question kept pounding in my head. What was the point of pretending he died at the end of season one? Why keep him in Middle-earth for the entire second season if all he does is a very brief rescue mission he barely contributed to? How did leaving him here actually serve the story? As far as I can tell, it was to keep him out of Numenor and give his sister a motivation for being a political radical. He has a sister, by the way. I don't think I've mentioned till now, but she has this small, irrelevant Builder's Guild plot in the last season and helps to pose a queen in this season. 
She and Elendil are constantly mourning Isildur's apparent death. It's the primary reason his sister hates the queen. So I guess that's why they had him in the Southlands? Unfortunately, the writers didn't seem to have a plan for him in the meantime. They actually feel like they're stalling. For what, I can't say. They've let 40% of a five-season show come and go, and what have they accomplished? We know where Isildur ends up, and they've shown us how he begins. They have had two seasons to start bridging the gap between the two. Tell me, have they done that? We know he will be brave. He's shown to be brave. Okay, he will be a leader of men. He's displayed no leadership qualities, and the writing has made no effort to develop hints of some in the future. They've given him a rushed romance and a few friendships on the mainland that I'm sure will be relevant when he returns. They've introduced a vague notion of restoring the true Numenor, but failed to elaborate what that means. They introduced a desperate desire to be great that's lessening as soon as it's introduced. They confront him with the horrors of war, but forget to show him grieving in the aftermath. Where are they going with this? Who do they want this man to be? What will he stand for when he stands against Sauron? What will be corrupted once he holds the ring? There are pieces here. The need to be great is something that could be exploited by the ring, if the writers use it. His dream of a true Numenor is something that could drive him when he makes a kingdom, if the writers use it. But these are just pieces. They need to be put together in a narratively compelling way, and for the moment, that is not what's happening. Part of the problem is simple math. Isildur is only one story in a tangled, bloated web of a dozen subplots, and the show struggles to budget its time for each character. In a season dedicated to only him, Isildur's entire story would fill maybe two episodes. But buried amidst dwarven family drama, royal coups, desert hobbits, dark wizards, doomed blacksmiths, manipulative angels, elvish ring bearers, city sieges, and orc betrayals, it is stretched until it is but butter scraped over too much bread. So what could have been done in the small amount of screen time available? Well, the first thing is to pick one character arc for Isildur, one plot, and commit to it. You don't have time for romance, and war PTSD, and drowning mom trauma, and family separation angst. Focus on one. I don't care which and make each of his scenes contribute to whatever overall arc you're trying to do for him. Second, the action should serve the plot. Isildur's story had a lot of action beats. Spiders, bandits, mudworms, ents. The scenes themselves are fine, and in isolation actually are structured pretty well. But in the grand scheme of the plot, almost all of them are irrelevant. They don't add to the emotional journey Isildur is supposedly on and we don't have time for meaningless action. Make them matter or cut them. As it stands, a Sealder's plot feels half-baked, a character concept cobbled together and then presented out of order, without clarity, without purpose, without direction, without vision. But that's just my opinion. Thank you for watching. I'm going to see the Rohirrim anime movie tonight, so expect my review of that within the week. Subscribe if you would like to be notified when I post that. If you would like to read a different story about blacksmiths forging coveted and cursed magic items, do check out my book, Bone Song, Diary of a Sentient Sword. Click the link below to start reading for free. I appreciate the support. <laughs>